Thank you, Linda. Um, just before I read this passage from uh, Philippians, we're going to be continuing our uh, series on life with God. Um, we're going to be looking at Philippians chapter 2. Keep in mind that the Apostle Paul is writing from prison. He's writing from a place of difficulty and suffering to people who were struggling with some certain amount of persecution and suffering. Let us pray. O oh Lord, there is none like you among the gods, nor are there any works like yours. All the nations that you have made shall come and worship before you, O oh Lord, and shall glorify your name. For you are great, and you do wondrous things. You alone are God. Teach us your way, O oh Lord, that we may walk in your truth. Unite our hearts to fear your name. We give thanks to you, O Lord our God, with our whole heart, and we will glorify your name forever. For great is your steadfast love toward us. You have delivered our souls from the depths of Sheol. You, O Lord, are a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Turn to us and be gracious to us. Give us strength that we may energetically live the gospel of Jesus Christ in winsome and persuasive ways. All this we ask in the name of the Messiah. Amen. Philippians chapter 2, beginning in verse 12, and reading down through and including verse 30. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. Do everything without complaining or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a crooked and depraved generation in which you shine like stars in the universe as you hold out the word of life, in order that I may boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor for nothing. But even if I am being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and the service coming from your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. So you too should be glad and rejoice with me. I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, but I also may be cheered when I receive news about you. I have no one else like him who takes a genuine interest in your welfare, for everyone looks out for his own interests, not for those of Christ Jesus. But you know that Timothy has proved himself, because as a son with his father, he has served with me in the work of the gospel. I hope, therefore, to send him as soon as I see how things go with me. And I am confident in the Lord that I myself will come soon. But I think it necessary to send back to you Epaphroditus, my brother, fellow worker, and fellow soldier, who is also your messenger, whom you sent to take care of my needs. For he longs for all of you and is distressed because you heard that he was ill. Indeed, he was ill and almost died. But God had mercy on him, and not only, not on him only, but also on me, to spare me sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore, I am all the more eager to send him, so that when you see him again, you may be glad, and I may have less anxiety. Welcome him in the Lord with great joy and honor men like him because he almost died for the work of Christ, risking his life to make up for the help that you could not give me. The word of the Lord, I trust, will hear and take to heart uh, these words. Well, most of us have seen a, a sitcom where the boss is away or the parents are away and everyone is just doing whatever they want. And then, of course, there's some sort of noise in the driveway or there's a noise on the elevator and everyone panics because the boss or the parents are returning. How many of you have seen a sitcom with that kind of scenario, right? And we laugh because most of us have been there. 
our parents went away, the boss went away, and we thought, I'm going to do it my way. <laughs> I'm not going to follow all of the rigmarole that this person requires of me. And so we, we kind of know that that is part of each and every one of us. And so we can identify a little bit with what is taking place on that sitcom. The Apostle Paul is sort of like a spiritual parent to the Philippians. And now he's in prison, but he's writing to them. And he kind of writes to them and he says, I'm really proud of you. Not only when I'm present do you act like good Christian people, but even when I'm not there, you continue to act like Christian people. You continue to live the gospel in a, in a good way. So the Apostle Paul is commending their obedience and their faithfulness to living the gospel of Jesus Christ to the glory of God, regardless of the situation. Now, Christ followers energetically live out the gospel daily. They do it in reverence. They do it in sensitivity to God, for the Holy Spirit is at work in every believer. Now, my guess is some of you are thinking right now, well, maybe that's the believers that you know, Pastor, but I know some believers, and they don't actually show much energetically serving, and they certainly don't seem to be very reverent, and they certainly don't to be, seem to be very sensitive. Well, I think you're right. I know people who call themselves believers, and yes, they don't fit this description that I just gave. But bear in mind, I'm giving the description that the Apostle Paul kind of lays out here. This is what a Christian is supposed to be like. <laughs> this is what a Christian is if they're really living to God's glory, if they're empowered by the Spirit of God, if they're going forward in that way. I can take you to a junkyard and show you a truck, and uh, it will kind of look like a truck. You might even identify it as a truck, but it's no longer functioning like a truck. It's not doing what a truck was designed to do. It's not fulfilling its purpose. When I was growing up in New York State, we had lots of what we call hedgerows. And those hedgerows not only had rocks in them, but they had old farm implements and equipment. And you could find lots of old pickup trucks in the hedgerows of New York State. Fortunately, um, the county that I was in, they decided they were tired of all that stuff and they decided to tax every implement in the hedgerows. And you would be surprised how quickly those disappeared <laughs> in the next couple of years because people got the got the bill they took aerial fo photographs you know in the winter and then they wrote down how many vehicles were there <laughs> and sent the bill and everybody was like whoa <laughs> but anyway you get the idea that uh, it's not necessarily living out the purpose that was designed so god has this design this purpose for every believer and that was what the apostle paul is talking about unfortunately not every believer is tapping into the power of the Holy Spirit. Not everyone is really reading the Word of God and allowing these truths to sort of permeate their heart, permeate their mind, and begin to impact the way they live their life. So, the Apostle Paul is reminding these persecuted and suffering believers in Philippi that living for Jesus Christ faithfully requires the power of the Holy Spirit, the guidance of the Holy Spirit. So how do we do it? How do we, as believers in Jesus Christ, live in sensitivity to God, in reverence to God, and how do we go about really honoring God in the power of the Spirit? Well, I want to start out with these ideas that I've laid out. One is energetic, that we should do things with a certain amount of enthusiasm. Enthusiasm for the God that we serve, but also enthusiasm for the mission that God has called us to. What we are doing is proclaiming a truth that transforms lives. We are proclaiming a truth that gives people hope for this life and hope for eternity. What we are doing is revealing the pages of Scripture with the very fabric of our lives. When they hear us, when they see us, they see these truths of Christ lived out. Living the gospel for the glory of God is an amazing opportunity, and we should be doing it with vigor and with joy. Now, I'm not saying it won't be without cost. There is a cost if you're going to live the gospel. 
Jesus paid a cost for living the gospel, and everyone who follows him is going to pay a certain amount of cost. But what holds us forward as we press into this purpose that God has for us is the fact that God is with us. He's empowering us. He's guiding us. He's protecting us. He's providing a family, a community that can support us in this great purpose, this great mission. So every day is this adventure with God. Even ordinary events can be transformed. You get a flat tire, you think, ah, a flat tire, and it's a busy road, and it's raining, and you think, ah, but God can use even something like that as an opportunity for us to further his work in the world. I've seen it over and over. Not the flat tire, mind you, but God working, you know, in our lives. The spiritual life, Marjorie Thompson says, is the increasing vitality and sway of God's spirit in us. It is a magnificent choreography of the Holy Spirit in the human spirit. It's a beautiful sort of dance almost that, that we're involved with as we walk with God. To live for God, we must live with God, as one person said. And so as we're living with him, more and more of his light, his love, his truth begins to flow from our lives in every way. Now, the next word I put down is reverence. Um, you know, this text talks about fear and trembling, but I think reverence would be a better word for most of us because fear in our day and age has a whole different connotation. <laughs> but reverence is understood. And that's what I think the text is really calling us to, to honor and respect God in everything. Now, the first thing he says is do everything without complaining. <laughs> that's easy to say, but it's not easy to do, okay? How many of you would admit that there was a little bit of complaining in the last week, okay? Yes, um, if you've read the paper, if you've been involved listening to any media, you, you probably had a real strong inclination to do a certain amount of complaining. Now, this advice is for all disciples, those who are pessimist, those who are optimists, those who see the glass half empty, and those who see the glass half full. And remember, the engineers say there's more glass than is necessary, but that's a different story altogether. If we increase, if we cease complaining, we really will stand out in the crowd, don't you think? I mean, talk radio, I don't think they do anything but complain on <laughs> talk radio. And if you look at a lot of the, the media feeds, it's, it's just a lot of complaining. If we could just stop complaining, and I'm speaking to myself as well as everyone else. If we can just do that, if we can exhibit that kind of reverence for God and for what God is doing in the world, it will be noticed. You can guarantee it will be noticed. When people complain to you, how are you going to respond? Are you going to join them in the complaint? Or are you going to say something else? Are you going to do something else? Complaining generally brings people down. Yes, misery likes company, but not forever. <laughs> you know, nobody wants to be miserable forever. So even if they're feeling miserable, don't join them in the misery. Try to bring them to some new place. What does reverence and faithfulness look like in the face of complaining? That's a good question. And that's what this text is calling us to think about. Now, the next one is even more interesting. It says, do everything without arguing. Does anybody have a relative that just loves to argue or a friend? <laughs> and no matter what you say, no matter what you do, they want to catapult it into an argument. And you're like, ah, I don't want to do another argument. I've had people tell me they don't even want to go to certain holiday celebrations because they know what's going to happen. It's going to end up with an argument with uncle so-and-so or cousin so-and-so. Arguments become a very difficult thing. Now, when it says do everything without argument, does that mean you can't join a speech or debate team? 
No, I don't think that's what it's talking about. Does it mean that you have to give up apologetics? You can no longer give a reasonable argument for the faith of, of the Christian faith. And I don't think that's what it's meaning. But there are certain appropriate times for discussion and debate and argument. And then there are places that it really is not appropriate. Arguing often escalates in volume and intensity such that everyone around starts to feel uncomfortable. We were in a restaurant one day and uh, two of the employees started to argue. And they were speaking another language. I don't even know what they were talking about, but you could sense the tension in the whole restaurant going up and up. You know? And everyone's like, oh, do we leave? Do we, you know, there's that sense that happens. There is one time when it's impossible for you to learn, and that's when you're talking. That's when you're arguing. You're not learning. No, 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 you're not learning at that point. You need to stop arguing, to stop talking, to increase that listening capacity. So what does reverence and faithfulness look like in the presence of someone who wants to argue with you? It's been wisely said, the heart of loving well is listening well. I'm going to say that again. The heart of loving well is listening well. You want to love this person who's arguing with you? Then listen well, but don't enter into this big argument. So the Apostle Paul tells us to work out this salvation with fear and trembling, which I'm talking about sort of reverence and, and energetically. And the result is that we would be blameless and pure, living holy lives that shine like stars in the darkness. I've already mentioned, if we stop complaining and we stop arguing, we are going to stand out. We are going to be noticed. And in this case, Living a life that is a blameless life, a righteous life, really will stand out in bold ways. We live as apprentices of Jesus Christ, both as a community of faith on Sunday, but also as we take up our roles the rest of the week. You might say, well, I'm retired. Well, maybe you are retired. That's great but you still are doing something the rest of the week, and what you're doing the rest of the week needs to reflect your faith as much as what happens here in a sanctuary on a Sunday morning. Our worship is what God has called us to do. It might be being a mom or a dad or a grandma or a grandpa. It might be being a good neighbor. It might be what other, other calling God has on your life. But what you're doing in those moments needs to reflect the beauty of this faith, of this truth. We need to see the presence of God, not just on moments of gathered believers in worship, but every moment of every day. Do you see God, that God is already present, that he's already speaking, that he's already at work in our world? There's no place you can go in our world that God is not already there working out a plan in that corner of the world. Lisa, a Christian leader in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, regularly prays this prayer. Lord, who would you have me to be with today? And how would you have me be with them? Think about that. It's a very simple prayer. I'll read it again. Lord, who would you have me to be with today? And how would you have me be with them. If you're going to work, if you're going as a volunteer to a particular place, God has called you there. That's where you're going. How does God want your pres his presence to be exhibited through you in that setting? The ethical challenges that you may have at work, the difficult relational dynamics in your extended family, the political war zones of our day and our era, are not beyond the presence of our living God. They're not beyond the grace of our amazing God. And you may be the one, as an apprentice of Jesus Christ, who's to bring that to that particular place where you're going. Holiness as a biblical concept has led some people to think 
that we're at odds with the world, that we're at war. We talk about sometimes culture wars and all that kind of stuff. And it's led people to think, well, I need to withdraw myself completely from the world and separate myself. And that understanding of holiness and purity is not generally the full tenor of what the scriptures are calling us to. We are to be in the world, but not of the world. We are to be holy in the presence of those who are unholy. We are to be light in the darkness. We're to be salt in a place that desperately needs the preserving spiciness of our salt. Luke Goodrich, in his book, Free to Believe, wrote these words. He offers this important reminder that each of us in these late modern, postmodern days of our world, that we can expect a certain amount of marginalization, a certain amount of rejection, and at times even hostility to the Christian faith that we cherish, while affirming the importance of preserving religious liberty for all as a high priority, Luke Goodrich rightly reminds us, as apprentices of Jesus, we're called not to win, but to be like Jesus. Rather than assume a cultural posture, we can evidence a kingdom posture. Luke Goodrich offers these important words of wisdom. In short, we don't try to win a culture war. We try to glorify God by being like Christ. Well, that's a challenging calling because we're sucked in so easily to the complaining, to the arguing, to the stuff that drives us crazy within our world. And we're very, very tempted to just go with the flow where everyone else is going. But God wants us to be salt and light. He wants us to be faithful. He wants us to show the holiness of God. He wants us to show humility. We are not there to win. We are there to be representatives of Jesus. We're to be apprentices of Jesus Christ in our work world, in our volunteer world, in our family, in our neighborhood, wherever we might go. And the final thing I wanted to mention is about sensitivity to God's position, God's power, and God's leading. How many of you have ridden a horse? Anybody ridden a horse? Okay. You kind of know a little bit about horses if you've ridden them. Um, they're not my favorite beings to be on. I like looking at them. I like seeing them run through the field, but I really don't want to be on one, to be quite honest with you. But if you've noticed anything about horses, you notice that they all are different in the way they respond to the rider, right? We went a couple of years ago to see one of the horse shows over at the National Western Stock Show. And these people got on this horse bareback. They didn't even have reins, and they got this horse to do everything. I don't know how they did it. I think they squeezed their legs and talked to it. But anyway, the horse would run around and stop and back up and do all this stuff. And I'm like, they didn't even have anything, you know. If I got on a horse, it would do whatever it wanted, regardless of what I did, you know. But you understand that there's a difference in the way these horses respond, right? The reality is we are different in the way we respond to God's Spirit. God's Spirit is trying to nudge us, trying to lead us, trying to guide us. And the more sensitivity we have to the Spirit of God, the more quickly we move in the ways God wants us to move. We walk the path that God wants us to walk. Now, we can resist. Um, I have to admit, I've sometimes resisted. Um, sometimes I've resisted for more than just a few minutes or a few hours. Sometimes I've resisted for days. But finally, I realize, ah, that's not a very good idea. And I follow the leading, the sensitive, being sensitive to what the God is, is guiding me to do. One key characteristic of a growing disciple of Jesus is a growing sensitivity to the guidance of the Holy Spirit. If you want to be faithful to the ways of the Lord, there's no way you're going to do it without the power and guidance of the Holy Spirit. And so developing that sensitivity and moving more and more 
in life with that sensitivity to the Spirit makes all the difference. Every day we grow as followers and disciples of Jesus means every day we're becoming more and more aware of God's presence. We're more sensitive to what he is telling us. God wants to lead us and guide us every moment of every day, but we kind of contain him in certain times and in certain places. Instead of saying, he's with me all the time, I need to be sensitive to him all the time, I need to let the Spirit guide me at every moment. Now, you know, many people think pastors just want people to be faithful in attending church, you know? <laughs> but all the pastors I know, they want people to be faithful disciples 24-7. You're in this sanctuary maybe for an hour, hour and 10 minutes if I go long, right? But that's just one hour. What really needs to change the world is people to be Christians 24-7, wherever they go. Summertime. Sometimes the windows are open and you can hear what's going on in your neighborhood. You might even hear something that's happening three houses down because the argument's getting a little heated and it's getting a little louder. Maybe it's just a couple kids the next block over arguing about a basketball game, which I still like to hear actually, by the way, as they play basketball outside. Think of it, even in the highest percentage time when people attended church, do you know when that was? When was the biggest attendance of church in America? Give a guess what year. No, it was past 42, past 50. It was 55 to 58. In those years, almost half of the American population went to church on a regular basis. And if you think that's what's really going to change the world, then why did we have the 60s and the 70s if that was really what's going to change the world? No, I don't think that works. What really needs to have happen is people need to be living by the sensitivity to the Spirit, by the truth of God's Word, every day, every hour, and then we're going to see a transformation within our land. Do you know that most people today don't know a Christian that they respect and like? They don't know one. And if they do know one, they don't know they're a Christian. <laughs> they might like someone and not even realize oh, that person is a follower of Jesus Christ. Our challenge today in our day and age is just to live the gospel. Live it moment by moment, day by day. And it's not easy. My wife reminds me regularly while I'm driving, hey, be patient for that person. <laughs> because I drive like New Yorkers, you know. <laughs> it's great to have an hour to set aside to God, but the remaining 167 hours, we need to be living the gospel. Whether we're behind the wheel, in line at a checkout, at work. Dorothy Sayers, the renowned writer and Anglican Christian, who led by example for believers to do all that they could to bless the world, said, the only Christian work is good work well done. You know, some people go to work and they think, I'm going to be an evangelist at work. Well, just do your job well, really, really well, and that will be a witness. Don't be out there, you know, bugging everybody with flyers and everything else, thinking that that's the way to really be effective. The most effective way is just live the gospel and do your work well. We do not have time to consider more carefully the rest of this chapter, but Timothy and Epaphroditus are two amazing examples of people who did this. They were living the gospel, they were not arguing, they were not complaining, they were serving others, and they made a huge impact for the gospel. Not just on one person or one small community, but multiple communities across many, many areas. I trust that we can take a moment to just quiet ourselves as we prepare to come to this table and think about what the Apostle Paul is calling us to. 
Of course, you can't walk with God unless you're born of God. You can't walk in the Spirit unless you're born in the Spirit. And we do that through repentance of sin and putting our faith in Jesus as our Lord and Savior. But once we've done that, we begin the adventure of sensitively listening to the Spirit and letting the Spirit lead us. Take a few moments to pray now and prepare as we come to the Lord's table.